Spears. Welcome to Scott Spears Now. Tonight, I'm joined by one of my favorite people, the 40th treasurer of the United States, Mary Ellen Withrow. Mary Ellen, how are you? I'm just fine, Scott. Mary Ellen, uh, you know, there are some things I want to talk about. I want to get the word out about pretty much your own little museum out at Primrose. Oh, yes. Well, yes, I had some visitors today from Lima that came over to uh, see the museum. We've got uh, a room full of my memorabilia, and uh, it's a lot of fun showing it off, and I, I like to have people come and, and visit. Now, when can people see this? Well, it's uh, th the next uh, time that it's open will be uh, the third Sunday in August, which uh, I don't have the date off the top of my head, but uh, it's from 2 to 4 on Sunday, the uh, third Sunday in August. And we think this might continue. Yes, I think it's going to continue maybe uh, for quite a while. Mm -hmm. In that room, I, I just recently got the tour uh, from you, and it was wonderful. I, I didn't realize that, that that great amount of stuff was in there. What would somebody see if they walked in there? Well, they see uh, a lot of the pictures of, of uh, my time in office and, and the things that I did. And we have the uh, first quarters that were struck. I struck the very first state quarter, and that, of course, was in Delaware, uh, what they would do is bring the press to uh, where this was going to happen, and I would strike that quarter, and then they did it again in Pennsylvania, which was the second state, and in New Jersey, which was the third state that uh, joined the Union. So those three uh, quarters are exhibited in, in, they have their little boxes that they're in, and I have uh, Christmas ornaments that were... Um, done by Treasury and the White House, uh, a lot of those. And I have a, I have fractional currency. I have um, currency that's 101 on the serial number, which is where everything starts as far as the printing of money um, in all 12 Federal Reserves. And um, uh, then I, I also, I also have uh, some of the, the, uh, uh, like the correspondence dinner uh, uh, menus and the um, menus for the 200-year celebration at the White House. And and um, it, it's a lot of uh, things that I've gathered up. It's, it's quite a room full. It's very interesting. A lot of great pictures, a lot of great awards. It certainly is, is very, very fascinating. And free admission. Yes, right. It's a free. Uh, it's 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 a, well, a lot of people. A lot of people in Marion should go out and see this. And if you don't know where Primrose is, if you go out to the YMCA off of uh, Barks Road, it's just right back there. Go back along yes. that. It's Wellness Drive, is what it's called. That's right. Follow that yes. away. Follow that around, and and you will get it. Mary Ellen, since you were in last, oh, I want to talk about one more thing about about that room. I didn't realize you were in the Guinness Book of World Records until I was in that room. Yes. Tell right. everybody what you're in there for. Well, I have my signature on more currency than anyone in history, and um, and that's still the case. Now, how how did that happen? Well, we had uh, some good years. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Under President Clinton. <laughs> you know, you know, Mary Ellen, what uh, what uh, uh, drives the um, production of currency? Uh, what the requests from the banks. Uh, the, when the bank puts a request into the Federal Reserve, um, and then it's uh, produced. Uh, but um, the money that's produced, about 95% of it is, um, uh, you know, worn out uh, as it goes through. It's uh, it's quite a quite an operation to keep the right amount in in circulation. And it's it's controlled. I mean, there's no way that it's going to get out of control. Mm -hmm. How much of that money that has your signature on it would you say is still in in uh, people's pockets, still out there? Well, all the small bills are worn out pretty much. Once in a while, somebody will find a dollar bill, but it's very rare. The hundreds and the fifties, and once in a while, a uh, twenty. But the hundreds and fifties, there's a lot of them out there yet. I would say that nobody, certainly nobody from Marion, 
has went up uh, as far on the level, maybe in Ohio, as you have in the Treasury Department. What makes a good treasurer? Well, somebody that um, cares about the public, does their job, pays attention to what's going on. Uh, taking care of other people's money is not an easy job. Uh, you have to um, make sure things are done correctly, have good employees. What is the job of a treasurer for those who don't know? It's collecting and uh, protecting and investing the money of the uh, of the people of the wherever it is, whether it's a county or a state. At the federal level, it was different. I was manufacturing money, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I, I bet so. Yes. When you're investing people's money at the state and local level, um, what was your rule of thumb for investments? Oh well, you uh, you look for the best. Uh, you have your rules you have to go by, of course, uh, in what you can invest in. You're not investing in the stock market. Yeah. You're not taking that kind of a risk. What you're doing is uh, getting the best that you can get. And when I went in, uh, there's uh, every year there's uh, a two-year um, Board of Deposit uh, ruling that takes place. If the interest rates go up enough, you can get another bid from the banks. And so... Uh, this is what I did. It hadn't been done before where uh, we would get another bid within that two-year period because the interest rates were going up. And that made a big difference in the money that was earned. And also, I went into repurchase agreements, which hadn't been done before. And they were quite, uh, they, they were becoming quite popular at that time. And uh, I had, you know, checked always with the uh, prosecutor and, and the attorney general on, on the correctness of all of this. But you have to stay within the law and you have to um, probably um, keep yourself alert as to what's going on in the interest, uh, uh, what's being paid in interest. Mm. It's very inter a very interesting position, I would imagine. I want to talk about some things that have just been going on in the news uh, since we've talked, Mary Ellen and I have been on together, there have been so many uh, passing, so many passings of great people in this, this mm -hmm. country. I'm going to, four, or actually five come to mind. One was added just today when we're taping this show. Uh, but I'm going to start back with Andy Griffith, 86 years old. What did that mean to you? What does it, when I say Andy Griffith, what does that mean? It means Matlock. Yeah. I love to watch Matlock. Yeah. He, he was such a good actor. Yes. And I think highly underrated. If you watch one of his movies, uh, No Time for Sergeants or A Face in the Crowd, he is a tremendous actor. Yes. Uh, I forget what the first movie was he made, but he, it was a totally different part for him, and he was tremendous in it. Well, for people who think, because, I mean, they have conventions for the Andy Griffith show. Mm -hmm. For people who think he was just that, uh, boy, they're dead wrong. He was a m very talented actor. Yes, yeah. I, I thought he, his passing was kind of a seminal moment. I mean, because as far as TV stars go, you don't get much bigger than Andy Griffith. No, no, that's right. Very big. Uh, Ernest Borgnine passed away and at 95 years old. And the reason I bring this up, I had interviewed Ernest Borgnine. Yes, you did. I did. Yeah. And he was the n maybe the n just generally nicest celebrity I've ever interviewed. I remember he laughed through the whole interview. And he was, and he was a uh, not in a bad way. He just, he just seemed happy. He was just a, Is that right? a, a jovial guy, and maybe that's why he made it to ninety-five. Yes. He didn't let things bother him. Yes. Well, and he married. Um, who did he marry? Um, oh, the the Broadway star. Yes, I, yeah, I, I, I can't uh, think yeah, of her I name, but he was. Yeah, I can't think of her name either. But th that was always interesting. That. Uh, combination of two people well you know. he, he always played the i mean he won academy award yes. for, for marty and people always thought he was because he was a bigger guy he was this big heavy he was a mean guy nothing could have been further from the truth when you actually talked to is that right oh i yeah. uh, he was very nice 
another one that I had interviewed who passed away also at 95, also an Academy Award winner, was Celeste Holm. Yes, yeah. She, w- uh, she was a good friend of Dick Celeste's. Is that right? Yes. Uh, he had her uh, at the, uh, at the um, residence when uh, I was uh, state treasurer. She was a very nice lady. Her life ended, sadly. The last five years were not good. Her, her kids had been in a dispute with her oh. husband, who was 50 years younger than she was, and mm-hmm. sad that that happened. Mm-hmm. But, boy, she won an Oscar, too. She was a great, uh, yes. great actress. And, of course, another one from the world of television was Sherman Hemsley. Yes. From the Jeffersons died at 74. I always liked that show. W- yeah. Wasn't it? Yes, it was uh, It was upbeat. Yeah. <laughs> and a funny show. <laughs> yes, very. Well, it made me, uh, when, I'll tell you something, I was watching a Sherman Hemsley tribute on TV Land this past weekend, and they bleeped out the N-word when he said it uh-huh. in the episode, and they took out the interracial kiss between uh, Tom and Helen Willis, for people who know the show, which was actually the first interracial kiss on television. I couldn't believe that what they let on the air in 1975, they won't let on the air in 2012. <laughs> right. What does that say, <laughs> Mary Ellen? I, I can't believe that. Uh, that is unusual, isn't it? I, yes. I, I, I'm not sure why that would tick people off. I don't know, but uh, time changes a lot of things. Do you think a show like The Jeffersons could be on television now? Why not? Well, I said they take stuff out that was in it then. Oh, you mean that was taped then? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know. Um, I'd have to see it again. You know, maybe at the time I don't remember anything that I thought was wrong with it, but that was then, and this is now. I, I guess I mean more along the lines of uh, the political incorrectness. Oh. Because he, George Jefferson, Sherman Hemsley, he played a bigot. That's what he, like Archie Bunker, yeah. a bigoted man. Yeah. Would we sit in our living rooms in 2012 and watch a bigoted person? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think we would, I guess. Yeah, uh, probably not. What do you, th- are we more sensitive now mm-hmm. than we were? Yeah, yeah, because of uh, our president. Do you think that's a, a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think that it's, it's part of life and, and it's, it's what happens. I think you're right. A person who just died today, the day we're taping this, was Gore Vidal. And maybe a lot of people don't recognize the name Gore Vidal. 86 years old. Yes. Prolific yeah. writer. Yeah, Prolific he, writer. He wrote about everywhere. <laughs> oh, and was funny. <laughs> yeah, funny. right. Now, he wrote some quotes here that I'm going to bring up today because of his passing. And uh, I think they're very interesting. Any American who is prepared to run for president should be automatically disqualified. <laughs> what do you think of that one, Mary Ellen? I think that's that's kind of funny. Well, it is funny. Yeah. 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 Kind of a goofy quote. Yeah. Well, now who said that? That was Gore Vidal. Yeah. Uh, Gore Vidal was a very interesting man as far as, you know, his books. I, I did enjoy his books on, well, Hawaii and he d- he wrote about so many different places yeah but that that's a wha- what did he say again he said any american who is prepared to run for president should be automatically disqualified yeah well i think he, i think he's trying to say that anybody who would want that job has got to be nuts hmm well a lot of people want it they do yeah they do yeah the the other quotes are have nothing political overtones, but I think just are interesting. He said, every time a friend succeeds, I die a little. <laughs> now, that's another strange statement, isn't it? Well, but Mary Ellen, do you think that's true? Because I tend to believe there are people in the world like that. Yeah, there probably are. Who, who, <laughs> who if you've got a friend and they're doing better than you, yeah. and you think you should be doing better, that they maybe aren't you aren't as happy for them as maybe you could be <laughs> that that happens yes i, I right. think he was almost right on the money with that one do you yeah uh-huh. i i think i think there is a lot of jealousy have you ever had a jealousy of somebody well i suppose i have it's not important um how old was gore vidal 86 was he yeah uh-huh yeah um 
Well, he took a long time to write his books. He was very careful, you know, what he wrote. Uh, I'm surprised at those statements, though. They're kind of interesting. Well, the last one I have that he did, I think it was almost in the vein of the last quote. It is not enough to succeed. Others must fail. Hmm. But, you know, I guess that's the truth. I, I You know, it kind of rem- it reminded me of this thing we have now in society where nobody loses. Mm-hmm. I, everybody gets a trophy. Oh, well, yes. And in everybody the, wins. You know, in the children's sports, yeah. I mean, they don't learn how to lose, I don't think. Is that a good or a bad thing? Well, I don't think that's good, no. Yeah. How do you think... Why do you think we got to that? It wasn't always that way. No, I think uh, overprotected parents, uh, overprotective parents caused it. Why do you think this last generation has been so overprotective? Well, it's a natural thing. Um, I don't know. I think you lose uh, a little bit of life when you take that approach. You you have to learn the, the bad with the good, you know. We've talked in programs before. There was an election one time that you lost, and it was not a, mm-hmm. a happy... T- you didn't like losing. Who no, would? I don't like losing. Yeah, who would? Yeah, who would? right. Um, what did you learn from that, though? Well, I learned yeah. that uh, you got to work harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> do, do, do you feel you did... If you look back on it now, do you feel that you didn't work as hard in that election? Well, I worked hard, but but the odds were against me. Um I, and it, and it's it's many things that caused that. Uh, it isn't just the fact that I didn't work hard enough. It was the fact that nobody knew my name, and I had to get my name known. And um, all of that takes a lot of doing. And then there's factors that take place that you have no control over. What? How do you get your name known? If you're an act, not even a politician, an actor, a musician who's good, but people just don't know them. They don't want to take a chance on somebody they don't know. How do you get your name known? Well, it has to um, come from the media. Uh, somebody has to like you, and like you have to like me, Scott. <laughs> I do. I do. I, I think, you know, you know, it's funny. I'll tell you, Mary Ellen, people always say when you're doing interviews, they say, well, do you like everybody? It's easier for me to mask not liking somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, I can sit across from somebody I don't like, and you would think I like them, because mm-hmm. I'm not going to be rude. Mm-hmm. But when I like somebody, you can tell. I think that's just effusive. Yes, you know? yeah, right. I don't think you can cover that up. Right. Well, um, th- there. you know, I, I took over the License Bureau because I wanted to get known. That's how you get known, as far as I was concerned, because your name is on everything that goes out of there. And everybody has to come to get your supplies of whatever you're selling, which is driver's licenses and and car um, license plates and all of those things. Um, and and I um, I think you know does the media notice everybody? No, they don't. And how do you get that to happen? And you have to you have to work at it. There's things that you can do to get noticed. You don't want, you don't want to do crazy things, but um, something has to catch their eye, and then all of a sudden you're famous. It's interesting though. The things now that I think people maybe ten years ago, maybe even five, people would have said, "Well, that's nuts. That's a bad way to get noticed." People do sex tapes now that gets them known <laughs> yeah and, and that's what made their career i don't necessarily <laughs> understand how that happens well uh, we certainly want to wouldn't want to go that direction. no 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 but people do and it's okay now is it okay now not by me no, but it's okay. okay by the general public i think you think i think we wouldn't know who paris hilton was if she didn't do the the <laughs> tape really yeah. yeah i don't know i can't point to anything else she's ever done that got big big publicity she's really wealthy yeah but i don't think people started to follow her until she did that tape really that's when the paparazzi all this and kim kardashian the same thing really they all do these it's usually the girls Mm -hmm. for some reason Mm -hmm. i don't know what that is i don't know why that has such a i don't is it empowering for younger girls to control their faith, uh, fate because I guess it 
that's always been a men's realm. We've always heard the things for years about, um, um, you know, older men can date younger women, but older right. women can't date younger men. Mm -hmm. But they are now. They are now. Mm -hmm. So is this yeah. is this whole thing changed? Is it empowering to do things like that now for the younger generation? Well, uh, it's all right. You know, people. it's a free world, but... Um, back to the sex tapes. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a limit on on all of that. That that I I don't think you'd want to get known in that way. And uh, who has a good feeling about Paris Hilton or the Kardashians? I don't. You're right, but yeah. they they've made a lot of money off of it. Yeah, they did. And so what? You know. Well, I think a lot of people in a country with a bad economy they they want to make money. Mm -hmm. And would like to make, you know what it reminds me of, oddly enough, if we go back 25, 30 years, reminds me of Jim and Tammy Faye. Oh, but that was a pair. What were they yeah. known of before, uh, you know, doing some fraudulent, well, having an affair. That's what put that on the front page. Oh, it was her mascara. That's how I knew her. Yeah. I never saw anybody that wore so much mascara in my life. Well, you know, it's funny to me, uh, Pat Robertson is the only, uh, I think they still call him a televangelist, TV preacher. He's the only one that I know of who has not been, in, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, who has not been involved in a, a sex scandal that made him popular. Pat Robertson built his popularity on the 700 Club. But the other ones that we know, Jim and Tammy Faye, Jimmy Swigert, we only know them because of the bad things that they did. But yet we know them because of it. Yes, yeah. Well, yeah, you were always um, surprised because of being religious and then having that um, come out. It was always a big surprise to everyone. But you know, it's funny. The good televangelist who didn't do that, nobody has any idea who they are. If Jimmy Swigert walks down the street, everybody knows who he is. Mm -hmm. That's right. So yeah. I, I think it's the same thing with the sex tapes now. Well, it, it goes back, Scott, to uh, do you want to be known this way or do you want to be known that way? Yeah. I mean, how do you want to be known? And I don't think most people would want to be known that way. I hope not. That's right. I hope not. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, because it was in all the news, uh, we're going to talk about the Olympics, too, because I want to get to that. That's very big. I, I saw the opening ceremony. It blew me away. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was great. Well, let's just go into that. I'll save the other one for, for the end of this conversation. Uh, that opening ceremony in, in England, my goodness, with the Queen and James Bond. <laughs> yes. And can you believe she did that? <laughs> that, that was very clever. How would you have liked to have been the person who went to the Queen and said, listen, we got an idea. You're <laughs> yeah. go, we're going to pretend to throw you out of an airplane. <laughs> right. I, I can't believe she went along with yeah, it. Yeah, it was very clever. You know, I wish she had smiled more, though. Why doesn't she smile? I don't know, but she should, because she's got a lot to be happy about. <laughs> she's had this jubilee. Yes. She's uh, the star of the right. Olympics. Right, right. She never smiled. Yes. I, she was not smiling in the Jubilee either, and, um, and that was lovely. Uh, that was a wonderful event. Absolutely. Yeah. How about uh, uh, Paul McCartney then? Yes. And got yeah. choked up. Yes. I, I thought the opening ceremonies, and to see Muhammad Ali there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was at the one I was at, uh, the uh, Atlantic City. You were there? Yeah, Atlanta. Oh. I wasn't at Atlanta. He was in the, uh, the president's office when I was there. Wow. Uh, when we, w we presented um, uh, Olympic coins to the president and the vice president, and uh, Muhammad Ali was outside of the office. Uh, when we came out, we had our picture taken with him, and he was there because of the Olympics is why he was there. And, um, you know, he's, he's still uh, doing things. I mean, he was not in good condition when I saw him, and uh, he's still able to do things. I was thinking the other day, because Michael Phelps has now broken the record for most medals, mm -hmm. one in the Olympics, 19 could grow before they're over with, but who would you say is the greatest athlete of the 20th and 21st century? Oh boy, I don't know. I um, was thinking Muhammad Ali. In my mind, I don't think anybody did what he did. Well, go back to um, 
before the, uh, I think it was before the Second World War when they had the fight and uh, the, the German was supposed to win and our person won. Remember that? I do remember that. Yeah, Hitler uh, was counting on that. Uh, I would say that was a pretty big one. I think that was a, a change moment. Yes, right. Is there any athlete that, uh, when I say athlete, who's the first person that comes to your mind? <laughs> well, you know, Scott, I don't know. I don't watch many sports, and I'm trying to think of who comes to my Nobody comes to my mind because um, I'm just not into sports that much. Yeah, neither am I. I, I think of the ice skaters. Uh, Dorothy Hamill, maybe, comes to my mind. That probably uh, It's probably different with every person. It depends on what you like to watch. I think you're right. I think you're right. For me, though, I don't watch a lot of sports, but I I have a great respect for Muhammad Ali just simply because what he went through. Saying yeah. I'm not going to go, gonna go to war, they stripped him of the titles, and he came back to do tremendous things. I mean, and has done so much for kids, and even in the condition he's in, mm -hmm. um, well, he took his away his, goal, his Olympic medals because he oh, wouldn't. Oh, they did. Yeah, because he wouldn't go to to war. Is that right? That was, yeah, that's yeah, how it was I, I was then. not, uh, I guess I wasn't really aware of that. Uh, well, yeah, there's things that happen that uh, aren't always right. And then, of course, yeah. we have our Jim Thorpe. Yeah, Jim Thorpe from this, yeah, who, everybody knows about him. Who I, did, I didn't ever know him, but. <laughs> no, no, neither did I, but I just read a story that they're trying to get him dug up and moved back to Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, He's really? in Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, really? I just leave me alone. <laughs> you know, who, ne who cares at this point? <laughs> He's been there for years. I think he's been gone since the 50s. The other event I was talking about that I wanted to make sure we got into, because it's a big event, you can't get past it, but I want to come at it from a different angle, is the Colorado shootings. I don't want to have the, the gun conversation, because I think everybody's having that everywhere right now. Yeah, right. I want to talk about this, this uh, I'm not even going to say his name, but the, the perpetrator's mental condition. Do we pay much attention in this country to people's mental position uh, condition? It's... Um, the way he dyed his hair, the fact that he sent this letter to a psychiatrist, that he would do this at all, that he booby-trapped his apartment. Um, I'm not saying that should get him off, that he did this. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, do you think there might have been red flags because of his mental condition? Well, if he's as bad as he looks, I thought there would have been red flags, but maybe he's putting all of this on at this point. Could be. Um, he he could have you know uh, prepared himself. He he knew what was going to happen. I'm sure. You know, I wonder why he didn't commit suicide like so mm -hmm. many do. Well, who knows? But uh, anyway, um, if if he was in really bad uh, a men a very bad mental situation, now people that lived around him didn't weren't aware of it. Um, you know, somebody that's booby-trapped their apartment the way he had, uh, it, it was, you'd have thought they would have realized something was going on maybe, but uh, nobody did. Nobody said anything when he bought all those rounds of ammunition, you know? Well, that's, that's the segue I want to make in, because I don't think people look at mental illness in this country as a real illness. Mm -hmm. I think they hear depression, and maybe it's the Dick Cavett said one time, I heard him on give a speech, and he said, it's such a stupid name for that term, depression, because you're not depressed. You just feel, you can't, it's horrible. You almost feel incapacitated. Really? Uh, Winston Churchill had these horrible depressions. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote about them. He called them the big black dog. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think mental illness is regarded in this country like... Um, cancer or strokes or heart disease or anything of that nature? Well, I think it is a lot more than it was uh, several years ago. I mean, there's been uh, a lot of advancement on, on the understanding. Uh, Tipper Gore was uh, one of the people that really had that as her project to uh, promote the understanding of, of mental illness. Y you know what, and, and a lot of celebrities, Mike Wallace and Art Buckwald and mm -hmm. a great ma uh, Patty Duke, a great many of them had uh, done a lot for that. Dick Cavett, and I think they should because it's a horrible, mm -hmm. horrible it disease for it people. It must be, yeah. And uh, mm, 
It's just terrible. Well, Mary Ellen, it's always a pleasure to chat with you <laughs> about what, and you'll be back. Oh, I hope so. I hope so, too. Yes. We are going to take a commercial break, come back with Tom Oyster after this. Are you looking for affordable office space in Marion? The professional building located at 685 Delaware Avenue is the place for you. For more information, call 740-383-6803. Office space is now available. Again, telephone number 740-383-6803. Whether you are buying a home, selling a home, or just want to know more about real estate, call Curry Klingel, real estate professional. He will assist you with all of your real estate needs. Curry is located at 1794 Marion Waldo Road in Marion. Telephone number 740-361-6996. Curry is also on the net at www.inahurrycallcurry.com. In a hurry, call Curry today. Trello Romine's long-awaited autobiography, My Not-So-Ordinary Life, is now available. Trella Hemerly Romine is a Marian native who lives near Caledonia, Ohio at Teradice, her home along the Whetstone River, for the past 65 years. She is a 1933 graduate of Harding High School and former owner of Hemerly's Flowers. She also has played an integral role at the Marion County Historical Society. Copies of My Not-So-Ordinary Life are available in hardbound and softbound editions at Heritage Hall, located at 169 East Church Street, and at Hemerly's Flowers, located at 615 East Center Street, both in Marion. You can also order books online at www.teradicebooks.com. My Not-So-Ordinary Life the autobiography of Trella Romine. It's can't miss. Hey, Scott Spears back with you on Scott Spears Now. Joined now by a Marion resident who is currently running for county treasurer on the uh, Republican ticket, Tom Oyster. Tom, how are you? I'm doing good, Scott. How are you doing tonight? Doing pretty well. Good. Um, you ran for office uh, not too long ago. What was that position? That was for city council in 5th Ward. City council in the 5th <laughs> Ward. Was that your first foray into politics? That was my, yeah, the, for the first time that I actually ran for anything. Why did you run? Why did, why did you want to run for office? Well, there's, I thought I could make a difference in the city. You know, I had some good ideas, some things that, needed, uh, that I thought needed to be implemented, just some fresh thinking in, uh, up there in City Hall. Uh, you did not win that election, but I came very close. 51 votes. 51. Uh, <laughs> does that hurt? That was close. Um, hurt? No. It stings a little bit, though. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Obviously, you're coming right back, though. Coming right back. Coming right back. Did you know that night that you'd be coming right back? No, certainly not. Um, I, I knew that at some point in time that I wanted to um, move on, um, go in, into a countywide office, um, at some point, and um, just got to talking with some other people that were involved in the party, involved in the county, and they said, hey, we have this opportunity. We think that you'd be good at it. You know, uh, we know what your background is. We know what uh, what you do for a living, and we think that you'd be good at it. And so uh, talked it over with my wife, prayed about it for a while, and that's, uh, that's the direction we decided to go. When you ran for city council, what did you want to implement that you won't get the chance to do at this point? Maybe not ever, but not at this point. Well, this, the city council uh, is certainly a different office than, than the treasurer. As county treasurer, you're, you're in charge of basically the money of the county. Um, as city council, um, you're, you're basically um, another, uh, another branch of, of the mayor's office, if you want to call it that. I mean, you make actual day-to-day -day decisions on, on what happens. And as treasurer, you're, you're more behind the scenes. You don't really you know, set policy for the county or anything like that. So it's, it's really just a different type of position. When you decided you were going to run again and we're having these talks, um, what about treasurer appealed to you? Well, we got to thinking about what the basic problems 
in the county of Marion are. And it basically boils down to funding. And uh, if you don't have the, the money to do the things that you need to do, then we end up in the situation that we're at now where, you know, we're laying off sheriff's deputies, we're cutting uh, services, and, and uh, you know, the county in and of itself is hurting for money. So um, that's basically where it was. We saw a need, and uh, we're going for it. Where does the fault lie? I think there, there, there's a lot of places that you can, that you can point a finger at. Um, I certainly don't want to be the person that sits up here and, and points the finger at everything being my opponent's fault. Um, certainly the economy, uh, being in the situation that we're in now, um, everybody's hurting from Washington, D.C. down to you know, everybody that lives on Main Street. Uh, everybody's definitely feeling the, the effects of, of bad economic decisions starting at the, at the city and the county level and then going all the way up to the federal level. There have been a lot of bad decisions that are made. Um, when you come to the ones that are, that are here in this county, um, the biggest thing that I guess I can point the, the finger at is just the fact that things just aren't moving the way they should be moving, Scott. We, we've got a system, a uh, computer system in there that's just, it's outdated, it's antiquated, and I think we can definitely speed that up. Um, they don't certainly have a, um, a presence on the web. People nowadays, they want to do everything on the Internet. They want to be able to pay their bills on the Internet. They want to be able to get stuff done. They want to be able to just point and click three times and be done. It's a, it's a faster paced world that we're living in now. Y you can't do that. So that's one thing that I'd like to implement is try to, you know, get a better web presence for the county, get a better web presence for that, uh, for the treasurer's office and try to uh, be able to uh, pay your taxes online, be able to see where you're, where you're sitting with your taxes online, get a bill that way. Um, maybe even get your bill emailed to you instead of mailed to you. I mean, that would save the county money right there just in postage and, and printing costs. Um, the other big thing that's, um, we can point our finger at is that uh, the county is about $7 million uh, behind right now in the collection of taxes. And uh, the, the only place that you can point the finger is to that current administration, uh, you know, and the current uh, office holder there now. Um, it's just not getting done. So, you know, $7 million is a lot of money. And uh, that's money that we as taxpayers, we said, hey, we're going to allocate those dollars either to uh, public service or to the school systems, be that, you know, River Valley, Ridgedale, Elgin, Pleasant, th they all have um, operating monies that come out of uh, the collection of those taxes, uh, the DD boards on there. And these are all things that we vote on. These are things that, that uh, these different entities bring before the, the, the voters and they say, hey, we need a little extra money. The voters vote. They say, yeah, we're going to take those dollars. We're going to, um, this is why we're going to use them. And the people say, sure, we'll, we'll fund you for this amount of money. Um, and then when those tax dollars aren't collected, just because somebody doesn't collect them, that means the school system suffers. It means your, your DD board suffers. It means we lay off sheriff's deputies. And, you know, basically every one of our county um, offices, be that the engineer's office, the prosecutor, the auditor, the treasurer, all those people, they're all taking budget cuts. And a large portion of it is just because this, these dollars just aren't, just flat aren't being collected. Who's not collecting the dollars? That'd be the treasurer. Why not? Um, I, I don't know why not. I guess if we knew why, then we probably wouldn't have the problem. Well, I, I, I just, I'd never heard this, so I'm interested. Sure. So what, uh, how is it that if taxes are due, our money's due, mm -hmm. that you just don't collect it. I, I, it? Does it default out at some point? What happens? No, it won't. It, well, it, it doesn't default out by any stretch of the imagination. I guess if you got into a, a situation, um, it's always the treasurer's discretion. You know, they could waive or, or give a, a grace to certain taxes, but that that's extremely extenuating circumstances in, that, in those cases. Um, basically, people are just obligated to pay their taxes. Now, a lot of times those taxes are escrowed, meaning that when you pay your mortgage payment, the bank charges you a little bit of extra on there, and then they pay those taxes to the county for you. What happens is if you already paid your house off, or maybe it's a, a, a landlord situation where the people that are living in it certainly don't own the house, it's a landlord that owns the house. Um, anything that's an actual owned property that it's not mortgaged, the bank doesn't own it, um, they get a bill in the mail for their taxes. And if they don't pay it, there's really nothing going on in the county right now that's making them pay their bill. So y you could not pay your taxes in Marion County and nothing would happen? Under the current uh, 
administration in there, yeah, that seems to be about where we're at. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but uh, $7 million is a lot of money. So what could you do that the person in there now is not doing? There's a lot of avenues that you can do, and, and, and probably the one thing that I would use more than anything else is that the uh, Attorney General's Office for the State of Ohio has now set up a new program where um, – counties or even cities, municipalities, things of this nature, they can turn these people over to the attorney general's office and what they can do is um, they can actually collect those taxes for the municipality or, or the county or whatever the case may be um, by withholding your tax refund money. Um, the, the $7 million that we're talking about is property taxes. It, it's not an income tax. It, it's property taxes. And so when you get your income tax money back from the state, if you've been you know, reported to the state that you owe Marion County money, they're just going to keep your income tax refund that you get, and that money will come to us. In the um, – if you get in the mind of the person who's not paying this, why do you think they're not paying? Well, I think – Certainly, there's, there's a lot of people out there that have really certainly just hit hard times. And, you know, if, if your option is pay your taxes or buy milk for the baby, people are going to buy milk every time. And I understand those situations. But I would, um, I would say that's probably not going to be the case uh, on a large scale here. Um, and, and if it's something that, you know, people are, have really hit hard times, they've lost a job, they've you know, they've got medical bills coming up, somebody's sick, something like that. We're certainly not going to, you know, lock you up and throw away the key just because you've had, you know, hard times. There's certainly things that we can do. We can get you on a better payment schedule. You know, we, we may be able to give a little bit of grace here and there if necessary. But, you know, each, each individual case would have to be looked at, you know, individually. But, you know, there's a lot of people, um, they just don't pay their taxes because it's one of those things that they know there's no consequences right now. And so, you know, why write the county a check if nobody's coming for it? Did this start with the current administration or had this been going on before? Well, there's always a certain percentage of the taxes that you're not going to get collected. And, and most of that happens because, let's say maybe um, there's an out-of-state company that owns rental properties you know, here in Marion County. And then that's hard to track them down and it's hard to prosecute them because you're, you're going across state lines to do prosecution and things of that nature. Um, you, it's, it's difficult to make them forfeit the property at that point in time. Um, but <coughs> this current administration has certainly taken um, the delinquent taxes to a new level. Um, if you look at the county audit reports, they were averaging somewhere between uh, $300,000 and $700,000 a year that were not collected uh, prior to her taking office, and uh, now we're at $7 million just this year. If, Because at some point you are going to have a debate. There sure. will be the, the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. debate, if nothing else. We've actually already had one debate already. Already had one debate. We did. Did you ask this question? I did, and, and the, the answer, answer was. was that we don't have the money to pursue the collection of taxes. That was the answer that we got. And she says basically that we can't afford to collect the taxes, and I am here to tell you that we can not afford not to collect the taxes. This is $7 million that, I mean, it's, it's hurting the county is what it's doing. How much does it cost to collect the taxes? It, it depends. Um, if it's as simple as resending the bill, then, you know, you're looking at the cost of, uh, you know, a stamp and a couple of pieces of paper. Um, if you end up having to go the route of, uh, you know, foreclosing on the home, or and not only foreclosing on the home, but uh, them forfeiting the home and us taking the home, um, and that can get a little bit pricey. Uh, up front, granted, those, those costs are then uh, added on to the person that, you know, that we're collecting from. Um, as far as the program that I talked about earlier with the Attorney General's office, um, there is a small fee that is assessed to the person who uh, they're getting their taxes collected, but uh, with that program there is actually no cost uh, to the County of Marion for that. Is there any worry in that scenario to the person who's not paying, just not having enough money to pay, and being – because there's only so far you, I think you can go with – uh, uh, letting payments go and giving a mm -hmm. grace period sure. and so on because people have been out of work for a long time mm -hmm. and are in Absolutely. trouble I think um, if that's the case what would happen well you'd, like I said you'd, you'd really have to look at each case individually I mean they, they would definitely have to prove that there was some reason why they weren't paying their taxes because you know when you sign on the dotted line that you're going to buy a house 
you know, there's there's a certain understanding that you're going to pay the taxes then associated with that property. So, I mean, people need to, un, you know, understand that you're obligated to pay those taxes. Um, and when you don't, there's consequences for not paying those taxes. But, you know, every situation is different. We would certainly look at them. Um, I know you said there's, you know, a certain time frame, you know, that says that's, you know, okay, well, I mean, they're six months behind, not a huge issue, but if they start getting a little bit further behind, when does it become egregious? Um, I can tell you there's one example in the city. Uh, they took over a, a house into the city land bank. They actually turned it over to Habitat for Humanity, and what they're going to do is they're going to rehab it, and they're going to turn it into one of the houses that they then give. They, they don't give, but they'll, they'll provide that house to a, uh, you know, to a family in need. That was 17 years had gone by, and they had not paid a, a one nickel in taxes to the county. That's and that's why it was forfeited over to the county. This is 17 years without any collection of taxes on it. So the treasurer really can make the choice on whether somebody stays in their house or not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the the county prosecutor is the one who would actually, um, you know, take litigation to court on that. But uh, they're referred by the by the treasurer. If the treasurer doesn't turn them over to the prosecutor, then there's there's no action taken. If the number is this large now, seven million. Yeah. Seven million. If the majority will say of those people just aren't going to pay them, they haven't been paying them, they don't want to start paying them, they aren't going to pay them, are you going to have a problem going to the prosecutor and foreclosing on a lot of people? No, absolutely not. I mean, if this is a situation where the people are just saying, I'm not going to give you the money, then absolutely we're going to take legal action on that. Um, again, if it's somebody that's legitimately hit hard times, there's always there's always a way around that. But if it's someone that's just being belligerent and saying that they're not going to pay the taxes and they don't want to, then absolutely we're going to go to the prosecutor and we're going to take care of it. Does anybody know, isn't there some way to find out what, what the reasoning is on why people aren't paying their taxes Se to the tune of $7 million? I would say that if you went and talked to people individually that you could probably figure that answer out, but it seems like there's not a whole lot of that going on right now. In, in my mind, if we would go to the current uh, treasurer, wouldn't it be in her best interest to collect these? Wouldn't it be in her best interest to take that line, the stance that um, if you're falling on hard times, we'll give you a grace period, uh, but if not, we're going to collect it like we've always done business? Wouldn't it be in her best interest to do that? In your mind, why wouldn't she do that? You know, I, I, I just don't know why you wouldn't do your job. Um, you know, the, the citizens of the, the County of Marion elected people to do their jobs, and when they don't do it, then it's time for a change. I, I just, do you think that, um, well, how long has she been in office? I'm not even... She's held office for four years, but four she, years. she worked in that office for 20 years before that. 20 years. So she worked under somebody who did do... Yes. Okay. Uh, nobody ha really has any clue what what the problem is. No. That is, and, and she hasn't uh, answered that question publicly, so I can't even uh, speculate. Well, how come nobody talks about this? I, I haven't seen it anywhere. No, and I, I doubt that you will. Because? I, that I don't know. You would think that uh, the media sources that we have in uh, the city would, or in, you know, in the city and the county both would be all over it, but they're certainly not. Running for this office, haven't you went to those sources and said, here it is? I have. And what happens? And they say, wow, that's egregious. Somebody should report that. And then nothing happens. So, you know, we talk to people. We knock on doors. We try to let people know what's going on. And we try to say, hey, you know, I've, I've got some ideas here. I think we can uh, definitely improve on what's going on. And, you know, we collect $7 million from people. And and the thing is, the people that are that are paying their taxes, there's no problem with them. If you're coming in and you're paying your taxes and you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing, you're basically getting robbed from by the people that aren't paying their taxes because every time that we put another levy on the ballot or the, every time that the, you know, the city wants to raise the income taxes and things of that nature, you're already paying your taxes. So it's not going to hurt the people that aren't paying their taxes because they don't care. They don't care if there's another half percent levy on for, you know, for River Valley School, for an example. They don't care because they're not going to pay it anyway. So the people that are going to get hit with that are the people that are already doing what they're supposed to be doing. It, it's very interesting. We'll talk more about this as the uh, campaign goes on, sure. as this election sure. time goes on. And that's what I want to be able to do on this show is be able to talk about things that maybe people aren't talking about. I think yeah. that's good to do. Maybe we'll get some answers. Sure. Um, another question, just totally out of this realm, 
Uh, Marion City has now put a uh, 0 0.25 okay. uh, tax increase on the November ballot. Mm -hmm. That is, I believe, income tax. Uh, yes, I believe it is. Um, what do you think? Do you think that's going to pass? Do you think it's going to fail? Good idea? Bad idea? Um, I think it's a bad idea just because, again, I mean, the people that are doing what they're supposed to be doing don't need to be paying for the people that aren't doing what they're, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I, I don't think it'll pass. I really don't. Um, I think the citizens, you know, here in, in Marion are just tired of, of the government coming back to them and saying, hey, I need more, I need more, I need more. And, and oh, by, by the way, you're going to have less services provided but we need more money to provide you with less services. And I think they're tired of hearing it. No, no, no we, we need to touch on that because uh, earlier on this program, former Mayor Kellogg yes. was on and says he supports this. And okay. and he's a Republican. Sure he let's, is. Let's say and that. And a good one at that. There you go. Uh, so we have no disagreement there. No. He, former Republican, former Republican mayor, longest serving mayor in the city of Marion ever, mm -hmm. 16 years. Sure said he supports it because it will get back the services. Well, I hope that that's certainly the case. You know, if it passes, I hope that that's what they use it for. But, you know, in, in my opinion, I think it's the wrong time. I think it's the wrong time to come back to people with your hand out. And I, I really don't think that the people are going to support it. Uh, that could be. But I guess my question is, is why do you think he feels it will go there? Why don't you feel it will go to the police and fire? Um, well, it's... I, I can't speak for Jack. Um, Jack's a friend of mine, but I can't speak for him, so I really don't know what well, his mindset is. Why don't that. you think it will? Um, I just think it'll be one more reason to uh, to stick their hand out, and I don't think that uh, regardless of what numbers they run or, and and the numbers that they show, um, I, the numbers that I look at certainly don't show that a quarter percent income tax can put you know 16 police officers and 15 or 16 firefighters back on the street there's no way that we can generate that kind of money with a quarter percent. I just don't think it's possible. Does it put any back on the street? Sure. It'll put a few back on the street. And, and believe me, every one that we can put back on the street is good. But, uh, you know, I, th I think it's the wrong time. What could we do to get those people back quick? Because I think if you ask the John Q. Public in Marion, they would say we need those people Absolutely. back. Absolutely. I think, I think we need those people back, too. Um, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, I could get real political and, and start arguing the reasons why we have, you know, 15 officers that are no longer Well, go on ahead. You'll get no argument from me. <laughs> I, um, you, do, you know better than I do. I can tell you in the last year, um, both the fire department and the police department were approached by the city administration, and they said, hey, here's what your budget cut is going to be. And the way we see it, uh, you're each going to lose about 15 people. And the fire department took it to their union. And the union made concessions, and they said that the people of Marion are important to us, and we're willing to take these concessions, and we're going to keep our people on the street because we'll make our cuts elsewhere. Uh, the police department took it to their union, and the union said, lay us off. So that's what they did. There, there were no concessions made on the police department side. So why didn't they leave the fire fighters? What do you mean? The, 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 the police union said no, correct? Correct. The police union said they weren't going to make the necessary concessions in order to keep their people on the streets. Right, but the but the, the, fire fire de the fire department did say that they were going to make those concessions, and those people kept their jobs. So we don't have a lack in the fire. We do have a lack in the fire department okay. in the city. Um, but that's basically been caused by part of these concessions that they made is instead of laying people off, what they're doing is they're, they're allowing people that retire to not be replaced. That's the biggest thing that they're doing. So they've said, hey, you know... Um, They've had 15, 16, maybe 14 people retire in the last few years, and they just haven't replaced them. And that that is a cost-saving measure. I mean, you're not you're not rehiring somebody else, but uh, you know, the fire department's definitely suffering because of it. The police department union did not accept the concessions. Uh, why? That I don't know. Do you know what the concessions were? No. Well, they didn't make any, so I don't think there were any. Do you think that's wrong for a union to do? Um, I, th I think it can definitely damage the city. Um, so, I mean, obviously, had they made concessions, that we would still have more officers on the streets. But, you know, I wasn't in the middle of those negotiations, so I can't say necessarily one way or another that, you know, what, what the, uh, the people brought to them was, was a bad idea. I, I just know that they did not make the concessions, and, and because of that, there's 15, 16 police officers that aren't protecting the city of Merritt anymore. 
you know, it's, it's interesting, and we'll wrap up on this. It's been an interesting conversation. But it's interesting that, uh, you know, the reason we've got to this place is because the city is not making the money that it once made. Sure. Uh, caused by a lot of reasons, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly some have been cuts from the state. We're not funded from the state exactly like we were before. Right. So that's right. a big one. But, you know, I think it's a fall down everywhere. And when you get to the end, and the end result is – you know, the union says, no, we're not going to take the concession, and this is what happens. Uh, how do we fix the other things before we got to even having to bring that to the table? Well, you know, when you when you lose state funding, which we, we have done, and, and part of that reason is just because the economy is the way that it is. The state doesn't have the money that they used to have either. Um, the state's also required by law to have a balanced budget, so they have to make a cut somewhere. Um, I think that they made a poor choice in where they made their cuts, but I wasn't involved in those conversations either. Um, part of the, you know, one thing that we need to do is we keep losing jobs out of, out of not only the city, but the entire county. I mean, we're losing jobs and we're not replacing them. So, you know, that's not really per se the job of the treasurer isn't to go out and, and uh, you know, recruit new businesses into the county. But you know what? I think it's everybody's responsibility in, in one sense because when you're an elected official, you're entrusted with the county. Now, whether that's with the engineer's office or the treasurer's office or whatever your your specialty is in there, you're entrusted with that, that area. But you're entrusted with the county, basically, on that. So I think it really is, you know, everybody's job, you know, to go out and try to recruit new businesses in. But, you know, if we don't have jobs, then there's, there's not uh, – that revenue is not being created. And so we have to find another way to do it. And raising taxes seems to be um, – the way that the, the current administration likes to do it rather than, you know, thinking outside the box, finding some other things, maybe collecting taxes that are due. Right, that's just raise taxes and, d you know, dig a little deeper into everybody's pocket. Well, we'll have to talk as we go along more about maybe the new way to do this, maybe the, cha the right. sea change that needs to happen. Sounds good. We will do that. Tom Oyster, Marion County uh, candidate for treasurer. We will be back next time. Take care.